Hello, this is Michael Tracy. This video is going to look at a research paper published in 2020 called Into Thicker Air, Oxygen Availability at Human's Physiological Frontier on Mount Everest. As it turns out, modern science can tell us quite a bit about Mallory and Urban's climb. But as this deals with atmospheric conditions, we need to first look at the weather on June 8, 1924. I'll start with Bentley Beatum's photo taken June 8th at sunset. This is the day that Mallory and Urban set out on their climb earlier that morning. Mallory is somewhere in that photo. I suspect both Mallory and Urban were still alive when this photo was taken, but even if not, this is where Mallory's body would come to rest. So dead or alive, Mallory is in the photo. If Irvin had already fallen down to the bottom of the glacier, then he would not be visible in this photo. A couple of things to note. There is no massive storm, not even a cloud in the sky. And the lack of a plume coming off the summit indicates the winds were very low. And we have photos from earlier in the day, and they also show no massive storm. Just some clouds around the upper mountain, exactly the way Odell reported it. Ultimately, 12 photos exist of the mountain that day, so there is no mystery about the weather. It was very good. In addition, new research shows that on average, climbs in June have significantly higher pressure than climbs during May. This chart shows that the virtual summit for climbs in June is approximately 100 meters lower than for climbs in May. And if you look closely, you can see August with a red dot in it. The red dot represents an actual climb without oxygen. That is, of course, Messner's 1980 climb. Because of the higher air pressure, Messner's summit was 146 meters lower, or 479 feet. This means that when Messner summited, the pressure was the same as it would have been for a climber in May at the base of the third step. Of course, Messner didn't climb the third step, but his virtual altitude was significantly less than for climbers during May. In fact, Messner's 1980 climb has the highest pressure and therefore the lowest virtual altitude recorded for any oxygenless ascent. That is, Messner's Everest was only a virtual 8,701 meters as opposed to the 8,848 meters that people climbing in May face. Contrast this with Anatoly Bukrev's oxygenless ascent on May 10, 1996, when the mountain had a virtual altitude of 8,914 meters, 213 virtual meters higher than when Messner climbed. As a note, the highest summit was recorded by Swiss climber Erhard Loretan, in 1985, when he scaled a virtual peak of 8,949 meters, a full 100 meters higher than the actual height of the summit. For Mallory and Irvin, their virtual altitude at the summit would have been approximately 8,750 meters, or somewhere in the middle of this snow field. Because of the time of year they summited, Messner, Mallory, and Irvin were literally climbing into thick air. This also explains how Odell was able to climb so well, as the altitudes were virtually 100 meters lower. Typically, you can't climb that late into June because the snows and the warmer temperatures make the risk of avalanches too great, which is what killed the seven Sherpa on June 7, 1922. Thus, Mallory and Irvin had an extremely rare batch of good weather, clear skies up until 10 a.m. that morning and after 4 p.m. in the afternoon, calm wind all evening, high atmospheric pressure, a very late monsoon, and not enough snow to cause serious risk of avalanches. Now, a treasure trove of information has been made available over the last 100 years, and by using actual science rather than speculation and conjecture, we can put the following together. People who die on summit bids overwhelmingly die on the descent. Mallory and Irvin had good weather, and the atmospheric conditions lowered the summit by a virtual 100 meters. Norton had reached 8,126 feet four days earlier, and the weather was slightly warmer on June 8th. Mallory and Irvin had a large quantity of oxygen and had a solid plan to reach the summit by bypassing the second step and climbing the route east of the couloir, which I refer to the, as the zigzag route, or their alternate was to climb out the small gully from the couloir. They were sighted by Odell at 1250 at a location that only matches with the third step and would be exactly where one would expect to have them had they left their high camp at approximately 6 a.m. in the morning. They most likely used oxygen bottle caching as a document in the archives of the Royal Geographic Society 
is a manual written by the manufacturer of the oxygen system, and it has a detailed plan for how they recommended that the oxygen bottle caching system be used. Personal items that Mallory was known to have on the expedition, a letter from his wife Ruth and a photograph of his children, were not found on his body, nor were they returned to the family. While it is not known whether he had the actual photograph of his wife, it is known that he had a photo of his children, which was not returned with his belongings, nor found on his body. His goggles were in his pocket, indicating they were descending at night, and I outline an entire timeline of their climb in the watch video, which certainly has them descending at night. There is simply overwhelming evidence that they reached the summit, but the failure of the 1999 team to search for summit rocks means we still do not have definitive proof. And if Irvin fell all the way down the glacier, it is unlikely that any camera he had survived or that any film could possibly be developed from it. Thus, the best hope would be that, much like Sir Edmund Hillary, that Andrew Irvin also collected rock samples from the summit. On the they-didn't-make-it side, all the various reasons advocated over the years for them not reaching the summit have not aged well. The main objection was that Mallory could not climb the second step. Well, Mallory never attempted the second step. He just went around it, just like he said he would. That the cooker that supposedly rolled out of high camp preventing them from melting snow, well, that didn't actually roll out from high camp, and they could melt snow just fine. Then there was the so-called storm of the century, and that was debunked by the 12 photos of the mountain taken on June 8th showing no storm. The so-called storm of the century theory got its start when Graham Hoyland noticed a sharp drop in pressure recorded at base camp for June 9th, 1924. The problem was that there was no temperature reading taken at 8 a.m. that day, and it appears that the barometric and temperature were both read at noon. Thus, the drop in pressure is simply because he, the reading was taken at a different time of day as pressure fluctuates throughout the day. Given that we now have 12 photos from June 8th and other weather reports from June 9th, and none of them support that there was a storm of the century. Uh, it is clear that the pressure reading was uh, most likely just taken at noon or was simply an error. In any case, on June 10th, the pressure was again taken at 8 a.m. and shows no effects of this supposed massive storm of the century. The temperature readings are nearly identical between June 8th and 9th, also indicating there was no massive storm on June 9th. So most likely, the pressure reading taken on June 9th was simply an error, most likely taken uh, later in the day. Then finally, there is the notion that Mallory and Irvin's clothing was inadequate. This was debunked by a 12-year-old YouTuber who analyzed the clothing and the available information, and he presents an excellent video debunking that myth. I'll link it in the uh, description. Thus, none of the so-called deal breakers for Mallory and Irvin's climb have stood the test of time. And even for the details of the climb, most of the bizarre theories have been debunked. For instance, it was argued that Mallory could not have fallen from the ice axe location to where he was found because his body would have been more broken up. This was debunked by the fall of Yeppe Stoltz in 2000. Yeppe fell from just below the first step to the bottom of the Mallory Basin. Another climber went over to help him and found him in a self-arrest position face down, exactly the same body position Mallory was found in. Yeppe was a little bit to the west of Mallory's position. Upon arriving at Yeppe, it turned out that Yeppe was still alive, and he actually stood up. Unfortunately, he was not able to remain stable, and he fell again, this time all the way down the glacier. So the notion that someone falling from the ridge would be broken up or could not attempt to self-arrest was never based on anything other than rampant speculation. It turns out that Mallory's fall was not unique and did not require any other explanation than that he fell from the ice axe location, tried to self-arrest, and perhaps survived for a brief period after he came to rest. As this is exactly what happened with Yeppe Stoltz, no additional theories or explanations are necessary. And the one thing that the find of Irvin's boot does tell us is that Irvin kept his receipts. We have receipts from him purchasing the socks and the boot that were found. And yet no receipt for Irvin purchasing a Willish ice axe has been found to date. The most likely explanation is that Irvin did not purchase a Willish ice axe. In addition, Irvin's second ice axe, which he took to Everest and which was returned to his family, is not a Willish ice axe. It is also about three inches longer than the ice axe found in 1933 and does not contain any of the triple nick marks that Irvin supposedly marked every single piece of his equipment with. Thus, the Willish ice axe is most likely Mallory's 
and it most likely marks the location Mallory fell from in one fall in a straight line to where his body was first found by the Chinese in 1975 and subsequently located using the specific directions from the Chinese in May of 1999. So once you throw out all the theories that have no factual support, little of this mystery remains. The only mystery is why content creators continue to regurgitate the same debunked myths about Mallory and Irvin climbing the second step, about the clouds rolling in for the massive storm, or that their clothing was simply not adequate. Equally curious is that each and every one of these content creators still insist the Chinese reached the summit in 1960, even though there is not a single bit of verifiable proof.